Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we can be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I just wanted to start today um, and just to give everybody who's um, in attendance, like I said, first, thank you all for being here. Um, there's, um, I'm so honored to have such a wonderful panel of discussionists and Tawana Petty in the house to talk to us today about um, what anti-racism looks like. Um, with that said, I kind of wanted to start and recognize the historic context in which we find ourselves. Um, as of today, uh, close to 165,000 Americans have lost their lives to COVID-19. And around the globe, that number is skating dangerously close to a million. Um, and while COVID has touched almost every nation in some way, it's important to know that in all the places, those most vulnerable, the impoverished, the disenfranchised, the elderly, people of color um, have borne the brunt of its terror uh, the most. Uh, not even an hour ago, I learned of the news um, of my friend's grandfather succumbing to COVID. Um, and so I kind of ask as we enter into the space that we foreground the lives of those um, lost in our thoughts as we ask ourselves why uh, system change is so important as well. I also wanna recognize the historic choice of a woman of color to be picked for vice president um, within a major political party in the US. Um, no matter what your feelings are about um, Kamala's politics, um, the selection of her as a choice, the fact that it's divisive or even um, of some kind of unique interest uh, because of her gender and skin color should make us pause. Um, the U.S. is only among a handful of nations to have never had a female in such a position. Um, you know, I often encounter the question within organizing spaces of what led me to do this work. The work I see as decolonization and anti-racism. And I often feel as if I'm being asked, when did you realize that oppression isn't okay? Um, you know, so for me, I often say that if you aren't angry, you aren't paying attention. And to be clear, to me, anger is a completely justifiable reaction to oppression, aggression, blocked opportunities, mass incarceration, and murder. And um, I learned that as a small child. So for me, there really hasn't been any other choice. I can't ever fully relax until everyone else can. And so I guess all of us would know that old adage, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, so we all have an understanding that harming other people is fundamentally wrong, but somewhere very early on, the message got sent that certain people don't count as others. And so it became due on to some others. And that has to change now. So these are some of the reasons around this training and discussion today. Um, first, just because um, Tawana is an amazing um, inspiration to me. And um, I, like, I think everybody um, should be exposed to her brilliance and genius. Um, and because spreading the message of anti-racism, what it means and what it looks like is key to moving towards a more equitable society. And then second, because doing the work requires all of us. Anti-racism isn't a buzzword, it isn't a phase, and it isn't a neatly wrapped package. It requires daily dedication, a firm commitment to calling out injustice anywhere it arises. And as we all figure it all out, it's gonna look a little messy. So the hope is that today here, by learning more from those who have dedicated their life to this work, who incorporate anti-racism into this work, who think about anti-racism um, in creating more just spaces and, and helping us move the, the, the conversation to new places that we can all begin to move forward on that mission together. So with that, um, again, my name is Megan Douglas. I'm the community, um, Deputy Communications Director at For Our Future Michigan. And um, I, I know there's a lot of For Our Future people out here on the call, so shout out to you. Um, everybody else who's joined us, thanks so much. I'm gonna hand it over now to um, uh, Orlando, cause he's to my right to um, introduce himself to everybody. And then after that, we will, um, after we do introductions, we'll get started. So Orlando. Good afternoon, everyone, my name once again is Orlando Bailey. I serve as the uh, engagement director for bridgedetroit.com. We are a new journalism and engagement organization that is focused upon providing and meeting the information needs and gaps that Detroiters who have the most barriers to accessing information um, have so that they can have 
a better uh, quality of life. It's a new org. We just launched in the middle of a pandemic. I don't know whose idea that was, <laughs> but I come to you and to Bridge Detroit from Eastside Community Network. Eastside Community Network is, uh, I think about 35 years old now, 35 year old not for profit organization that I worked at for eight years, most recently as a deputy director, chief of development. Um, and it's where I cut my teeth in uh, community organizing, um, advocacy, and policy work um, under the lens of, of course, uh, racial equity and anti racism. We had the honor and joy to be led by two magnificent uh, Detroiters, Maggie DeSantis and most recently Donna Givens. I am, I moonlight as uh, the host of Urban Consulate. Urban Consulate is a network of parlors around the United States, uh, Detroit being a mainstay, where we convene people to have critical conversations about cities. And so I have this, these kinds of conversations all the time. And I'm also the host of a podcast uh, with Donna Givens, Authentically Detroit. So that that's who I am and many other things. I'm grateful to uh, Megan uh, for pulling this together. And I'm honored to share space with uh, Tawana Petty uh, it's a first and I'm super excited about it. So I will pay all of y'all later. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Orlando. Um, next, uh, Dr. Ham or Peter, Dr. Hammer, would you like to um, introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Peter Hammer. I teach at Wayne State University Law School and I direct the Damon J. Key Center for Civil Rights. Uh, and I think we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about the work of anti-racism later. But uh, pleasure to be here and, and thank you all for organizing it. Of course, thank you. And Tinu, would you like to introduce yourself? Peace, y'all. Um, so I am Tinu Rowland. I am the Detroit organizer for We the People Michigan. Um, we are a statewide organization um, that focuses on how do we be the bridge between all of the organizers in the state um, to make sure that we're creating our ecosystem um, in the way that we should be. Um, and then I'm also the education organizer for 42 Forward. Um, and so that's education advocacy. How do we fix this school system for our babies? Because we ultimately know that, especially with COVID-19 going on right now, that we have some reimagining to do. And, and now more than ever is our chance to reimagine what our schools looks like, reimagine what our entire ecosystem as a country looks like. Um, so I'm excited to be here with y'all tonight to talk about anti-racism and get into the, to the weeds of what people don't like to say. So I'm hoping we have a good conversation tonight. I think we will. Um, and uh, Dr. Newman, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, my name is Andy Newman. I'm a social anthropologist at Wayne State University. Um, I've been involved in a lot of research in partnership with community organizations and trying to rethink collaborative ways to really share knowledge and share research with community in Detroit and think a lot about partnerships between research and movement building. Um, actually, a recent project I was involved in was called the People's Atlas of Detroit. And we're really honored that Tawana Petty has a poem in it and contributed to that. And, um, and besides that, I've just been working a lot with undergraduate teaching and graduate teaching, but especially on the undergraduate side at Wayne State University and trying to think about equitable approaches, you know, to teaching at Wayne State, um, especially in my department. So thanks. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. And um, Representative Anthony, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. And thank you for having me. My name is Sarah Anthony. I serve as state representative for the 68th House District, which includes the city of Lansing and Lansing Township. And, and uh, uh, this term I serve as the Democratic Caucus Chair um, over in the House of Representatives. So I'm excited to be here and just thank you. Thank you for including We're so excited to have you. And uh, last but definitely not least, um, Ms. Petty, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Tawana Petty. I also go by Honeycomb. It's my poet stage name. I'm a lifelong Detroiter. I direct the data justice program for a Detroit community technology project. I'm a convener of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. I serve with Dr. Hammer uh, as part of Detroit Equity Action Lab. And I am a digital civil society lab fellow at Stanford PACS. And I like to 
have conversations with people about how we shift to the next uh, deepest level of our humanity. Thank you. So um, I guess we'll get started. For those of you um, who don't know, and I have a copy of it here, uh, Tuana wrote this book. It's called uh, Towards Humanity, Shifting the Culture of Anti-Racism Organizing. Um, it's available online. It's a great primer um, for how it is that you um, can start to rethink anti-racism. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna let um, Tawana take it away. Uh, she will be leading the next about 20 minutes or so of um, this training. And then after that, we'll get into a discussion with our, uh, the respondents, the panelists, and then we'll have time for question and answer. And throughout it, if you do have questions that arise, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, I'll make sure to uh, keep track of those and we'll do our best to answer them um, towards the end of the session. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm. this is gonna be uh, my a record short uh, <laughs> presentation. So I promise to stay uh, as close to the time as possible. So uh, let me share my screen. Oh, um, I think you need to make me a co-host um, so that I can share my screen. Here we go. Okay, so this conversation that we're having today is lessons in liberation. And I want to focus um, quite a bit on how we move to praxis, right? How we put the knowledge that we have into action. And so I'm not a PowerPoint queen. So this is, I'm telling y'all, I'm working it out for this Zoom life we now live in. So I wanna talk a little bit about act opting in and acting out um, and how we challenge racism, particularly anti-Blackness, because what I've learned over the years of being involved in anti-racism work is that you can do a lot of anti-racism study, teaching, education, and learning and never really touch on anti-Blackness. Um, and it is a global phenomenon we're seeing now um, after the brutal, violent uh, public lynching and murder of George Floyd, um, that uh, anti-Blackness is a global phenomenon because there's uprisings all over the world in defense of Black lives. It's literally something that I've never experienced in my lifetime, that level of uprising in defense of Black lives. And so a uh, major shout out to the movement for Black lives and all the folks all over the world who are challenging anti-Blackness. So I want to talk about these different levels of that I see um, as ways that folks are entering into the anti-racism movement. Um, solidarity being a, a very entry level uh, way to engage within the anti-racism conversation. So it's essentially um, when a person becomes conscious or cognizant of the fact that racism is an issue. And so they, they're now um, feeling sympathetic to the struggle. Right, but it doesn't really move beyond that. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't even necessarily move into empathy. It's more of, you know, what happened to you or what is happening is wrong. Um, allyship, which is the most commonly used um, level of engagement within the anti-racism uh, work and organizing, is um, really very not very far beyond solidarity. Right, allyship is. I'm acknowledging what happened. I'm acknowledging what is happening. I think it's wrong and I feel guilty about it. So we've moved beyond solidarity. We've moved beyond just, just acknowledging that it's wrong to feeling some guilt about it, right? So this is where privilege comes in. This is where the privilege testimonials that I have come to despise <laughs> uh, have come into play where um, it ends up being kind of like this uh, racial seesaw, right? Of uh, black and... Um, brown folks, particularly black folks though, um, in constant uh, uh, communication with white people around uh, their privilege and white people identifying with their privilege and acknowledging that they've made some benefits to the system. So, it, but it becomes kind of like a testimonial back and forth and it doesn't necessarily move beyond that. 
accomplice or co-conspirator is the next level. And that is the phase that I feel that most of the movement is in right now, where we see uprisings all over the world. We're seeing a transformation of uh, names of institutions. We're seeing reform policies and things like that. So that is an acknowledgement of what has happened, what is happening, um, that it is wrong. And uh, a lot of folks are taking black leadership um, and seeking out black leadership in order to figure out how to engage within the struggle. Co-liberation is a deeper level. It is kind of like solidarity, allyship, accomplice combined, right? This is an acknowledgement of the wrongs of the past. Um, this is moving into action against those wrongs by like the reform policies, the renaming of institutions and those sorts of things, and maybe even hiring more black people, though, you know, those kinds of immediate responses to, um, to uh, inequity. But it is also an acknowledgement of non-black people that their humanity has also been impacted by racism. And so this is that, it, this is the, the understanding that uh, white people are unable to uh, dig into their deepest level of humanity and be, be humane uh, within a system of white supremacy. And so how do we move to praxis, right? One of the ways we begin to move from all this knowledge that we've gained as we've moved from solid solidarity to allyship to accomplice to co-liberation is studying history. One of the uh, misnomers that happens within movement is that the folks that are studying, that are in political education, that are tuning into history are somehow not actively engaged in political struggle. But what we know if we study movements of the past that pretty much every uh, social justice movement that made any real impact involves study. Um, and so this also includes a knowledge of self. This is an understanding of how these systems connect with you as an individual. I am of the firm mindset that if you do not see yourself as part of a struggle, you are not going to stay connected to it. This also means tapping into ancestors. Contrary to popular belief, white people have ancestors that aren't slave owners and that um, were actually abolitionists and anti-racist. And so um, this, is, this is asking non-black people to tune into a history that allows them to channel an abolitionist framework, an anti-racist framework, people who struggled against the system and use that knowledge, use that connection to actively interrupt. So how do we challenge anti-Blackness? I'm gonna use Detroit as a perfect example. So if we think about Black people and a coronavirus, 40% of the deaths from COVID-19 came out of Detroit for the entire state of Michigan. That means this one city held almost half the deaths of COVID-19. This is an 80% Black city. Also during the height of the pandemic, more than 2,800 tickets for $1,000 each were issued to Detroiters for violating the stay at home order. Think about that. The median income of, of, for Detroit was $29,000 pre COVID-19 and since COVID-19, almost 40% of the residents have lost their jobs. $1,000 tickets uh, could turn a, a family into a situation where they no longer are able to afford housing or any of the other um, resources that are needed to make a living. And so you did not see this type of criminalization happen in predominantly white cities. Black people in surveillance, under Detroit's Project Greenlight program, there are nearly 2000 surveillance cameras at 700 locations in Detroit. And these are connected to facial recognition. We have now currently had two misidentifications of black men uh, utilizing a system that research has proven is racially biased. So the, the cities that have went to ban this technology are predominantly white. Uh, residents are able to advocate for their civil liberties um, and civil rights when the, when the community is not convinced that you need to be surveilled. Author Simone Brown, uh, who I uh, asked everyone to research, talks a lot about the 18th century lantern laws where if a black person was not in the presence of a white person, they had to carry a lit lantern in front of their faces. And so Project Greenlight kind of taps into this, this history of needing to surveil black bodies in order to make white bodies feel safer. 
So let's talk about black children in schools. Almost, although most mass school shootings have happened in white schools and in white communities, black students enter through metal detectors and endure police security guard searches while entering school every day. They are assumed to be violent even in high performing schools. And I wanna point all of this out because it's very important in thinking about how we dig into anti-racism work while actively challenging uh, anti-blackness. So what are some of the ways that we move to practice? Well, first of all, we dispel the myth that black people are inherently sick. If you notice during COVID-19, a lot of the media narrative has been that, well, these are people who, you know, have pre-existing conditions. Well, that pre-existing condition is racism. It is black communities living in inequitable uh, living situations and being um, treated unfairly through the medical institution. So one of the ways that we uh, can act in praxis is to inform about these disparities because the research is available and to resist that narrative. Surveillance ain't safety. We know what makes communities safer. We know that resource na uh, neighborhoods are safer. All we have to do is drive 15 minutes outside of any black community to see that the safer neighborhoods are the ones that are well resourced. Uh, in addition to when thinking about black children in schools, uh, we have to be honest about the disparities in schools and call them out. Um, and so if we know that schools in black communities, even high performing schools are, pre are criminalizing students and forcing them through metal detectors and, uh, and security, um, and searches, then we have to challenge that because it is, uh, has a psycho psychological impact on the children who enter those institutions. I'm trying to go fast y'all because I can. <laughs> um, so narratives shape policy and action or inaction. As I mentioned, um, I wanted to talk about the shootings in this particular workshop because uh, the dominant narrative that is every day in every media outlet about Detroit particularly is about the violence. And this is not me being naive about the crime situation that we have in Detroit, but there's a root cause to um, crime in Detroit. You can, you can tie crime back to quality of life issues. Most crime in Detroit is a quality of life issue. Um, but if we look at the mass shootings that have happened in schools and we look at the mass shootings that have happened in the United States, they are predominantly by white men. But these neighborhoods are not hyper surveilled. These neighborhoods do not have uh, law enforcement targeting uh, residential streets. Um, these folks are not going through metal detectors in their school systems, and they are not um, suffering under uh, mass uh, militarization by their uh, law enforcement agencies. So what do we do? We have to shift the narrative. Surveillance ain't safety. And there's a hashtag you all can follow and join in the conversation, and that is hashtag surveillance ain't safety. Um, and you'll see a lot of the organizing that happens around um, surveillance in Detroit, particularly through the organization that I represent, uh, Detroit Community Technology Project. But we're in coalition with Greenlight Black Futures, Detroit Justice Center, DEAL, and other organizations. But shifting the narrative is important because it has an impact on policy. The reasons why uh, cities like Detroit can have real-time crime centers, three of them, uh, and spend millions and millions of dollars on facial recognition, even though it is proven to be racially biased, is because many people have internalized the idea that Black people are inherently criminal and that they are worthy of being surveilled and tracked. So what's some visionary resistance to a situation like that? One of the campaigns that we are actively engaged in is green chairs, not green lights, asking community members to come back to the front porches, to see each other, to not watch each other. And this is not, uh, this culture is not just in our communities, it's in every community. We have shifted to a culture of individualism and surveillance through apps like neighborhood, um, and through other uh, ring doorbells and other ways of turning from one another and holding up behind our surveillance cameras and our, um, and our ways of watching one another. And so we're asking folks to, to be resistant to the notion that uh, folks are inherently criminal and to invest in 
uh, resourcing neighborhoods and communities and looking out for one another. So praxis and action, the myth of superiority, radical honesty. It's going to take radical honesty to shift against this notion of white superiority and move against anti-Black racism. Um, which means that we have to let go of this notion of privilege. And I know that that is challenging, right? But if we teach white children that they come into the world privileged, we have to teach black children that they come into the world underprivileged. And so that type of psychological impact um, has had a detriment on how young people are engaging within institutions, including school systems and in neighborhoods. And so we, I'm asking folks to climb this ladder. I'm asking us to move from solidarity to ally and up to allyship. I mean, it's baby steps, right? You start off being sorry about what happened. You move into understanding that the system of white supremacy um, is wrong. And you move beyond the notion that there is a privileged and an underprivileged class. You also shift into the accomplice mode, right? Where you're in the streets and you're transforming these institutions and maybe you're taking down statues and flags and now you've un you rec recognize that there are no black people working at your institution or you acknowledge that there that you know the film that you made has no black actors right those sorts of ways of being a co-conspirator to challenging anti-black racism but we need to move into the mode of co-liberation where everyone's humanity is recognized, which means that white people get to acknowledge that their children are suffering under otherness as well within their school systems, that white schools are being shot up by children who have been othered, just like violence in black communities is often a result of black children who have been othered or black elders who have been othered or black yelders, as I call myself, a young elder have been othered. And so this is asking us to look in the mirror, to see ourselves connected to the struggle, to tap into a legacy of non-Black anti-racist and abolitionists who challenge racist structures in their own families, in their careers, in their communities, and recognize that racial hierarchy is a myth. There's no privilege to being tied to a history of white supremacy, racial violence, or society that rewards a proximity to whiteness. And so until we can get to the point of shifting towards co-liberation, where we recognize that everyone's liberation is tied up in one another's, we will continue to uplift racism. We will continue to fail to challenge anti-Blackness and we will continue to hold up the system of white supremacy. Thank you. Um, that is a very short, very, very short workshop, but I hope that I gave you all something to think about um, as we listen to these brilliant panelists that are gonna come after me. Um, so I know everybody right now is like, wait, I need more. <laughs> um, thank you, Tawana. Um, it's always um, really, really grounding for me to hear um, uh, your theory. And I appreciate you sharing that brief look um, at um, what it means to take us into new spaces. Um, and so I think one of the things that has always come out for me and why I wanted to set this panel up in this way is that a lot of times we um, uh, interact with um, these, these theories or we hear about anti-racism and then we, you know, you, you leave from it and you hear it and, and, and you think you've done the work because you've gone to um, just to hear that. And so I thought it was really important to put in front of people's faces um, examples of what anti-racism um, work looks like in, in all kinds of different settings. Um, and so I think uh, we have, yeah. So we're gonna start um, by um, uh, Orlando, if you could discuss with us a little bit about your work and how anti-racism shows up in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, sure. I know I have about uh, six minutes, so I'll try to keep the time. I, I want to acknowledge uh, the genius that is Tawana Petty. Once again, thank you for sharing uh, that your knowledge and your framework. Uh, Tawana does a great job of reminding us all that we are on a journey and a, a journey of learning and a journey of being challenged. And 
uh, frankly, Tawana challenges me. <laughs> and and I, I absolutely love it. Uh, I, it makes sense for me to begin to talk about anti-racism work within the narrative, the dominant narrative context, because that is where I work. Um, I work at the intersection really of community organizing and journalism. I came home from Eastern Michigan University with journalism credentials and could not get a job in journalism and started my work um, at Warren Connor Development Coalition, uh, most recently Eastside Community Network and stayed there eight years. And one of the things that I began to notice as a very young man, 22 or 23 years old, fresh out of college, going into community development work, was that the narrative that was being cascaded by uh, white normative media in the city of Detroit, as well as national and international outlets as it relates to the city of Detroit did not line up with my day-to-day -day experiences with residents on the east side. And so I knew that there was sort of uh, this mismatch here, right? And so taking in the skills that I gained as a trained journalist, number one, uh, trying to do traditional journalism in Detroit does not work, especially when you're working on the east side. Your education, the education you think you got, will get blown up on the east side of Detroit. I'm just going to say that. And so what we had to do, what I had to do was, number one, honor the expertise that existed in neighborhoods uh, that may not have had the same degree that I had, but had that lived experience, and then figure out a way to amplify and uplift that narrative, right? So not necessarily me creating a narrative about what I was seeing, which would, would, which would have offered a counter to white normative narrative, but uh, lending platform for residents to express their own power in their own narrative was key for me. And so for the eight years that I was there, that was all that, was all that I did was do the intentional work of combating disruptive narratives about our community. One of the things that uh, Tawana so eloquently talks about that I just want to submit is when resident, in my experience, when residents had the opportunity to tell their stories, it was not coming from a deficit based place, right? Because oftentimes when we look at uh, normative media in the city of Detroit, we have two major dailies in Detroit uh, that don't have a lot of black people working at, there. And Detroit is a black city uh, uh, that when residents were given the opportunity to tell their stories, it wasn't from a deficit place. It was coming from a place where they recognized the asset of themselves, the assets of their neighbors, and the assets that existed within their neighborhoods presented with barriers that, were, uh, that, are, that have been put up, centuries, policies, uh, racist policies, systemic institutionalized racism, all of these barriers for that were against them being able to thrive. And so it wasn't that they were calling themselves marginalized. It wasn't that they were calling themselves disadvantaged. That was something that we put on our people. That was something that we had internalized, especially in the nonprofit industry where much of our language is influenced by philanthropic organizations. I don't have enough time to get into it. I got like one minute left. And so I want to uh, continue to remind folks to interrogate the language that we use. So Bridge Detroit, we, I was the first hire at Bridge Detroit outside of our founder, Stephen Henderson. Uh, what we set out to do was to create a newsroom that was demographically reflective of the city of Detroit. And it was a novel idea, right? Uh, our newsroom is ran by a black woman. I'm so happy that our newsroom is run by a black woman. And we are majority Black and Latinx in the newsroom. And so what we do every single day is offer a counter narrative. We're not interested in breaking news like the dailies. What we want to do is tell very nuanced stories about the life of Detroiters. We're all Detroiters working on behalf of Detroiters. And so the last, the last point that I would want to make and I'm always reminded every time I hear Tawana talk is that in order for me to do this kind of work, I had to sit down, be quiet and unlearn a lot of the messages that I took in growing up. 
Uh, and one of the things that I tell young people now is that Detroit should not be a place where you feel like you need to escape. And if you feel like you need to escape Detroit, what have you taken in to give you that notion? And I had to unlearn a, a lot of these damaging narratives about my city, about my people, about poverty, um, and about blackness uh, to be able to do this work. And I'm still on this journey and I am so happy to share this space with all of you. I'm, I think I went over a little bit, sorry. Very, very close. Thank you, Orlando, um, for sharing. Um, so um, I'm going to just keep it moving. Uh, Dr. Hammer, would you like to share a little bit about how um, anti-racism shows up in your work? Sure. So again, thanks for, for having me. And it's always a pleasure to spend virtual space with, with this great group of people. Uh, so I said before, I, I direct the Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights. And as Tawana was saying, we need to honor our uh, elders uh, and heroes and, and sort of just invoke the name of Judge Keith and, and bring him into these uh, troubled times as, as one source of, of inspiration. But from the very beginning of the Keith Center, uh, we took on structural racism as our generation civil rights challenge uh, and are trying to do that with the same creativity and imagination and hard work as, as our elders did with the first civil rights challenge, which was really more directed at intentional forms of discrimination. So it may be helpful to sort of give a, a definition uh, of what we what we mean by when we say structural racism and then a, an application and then the definition again, so we, we can sort of, of uh, have some common terminology. So at the Key Center, when we define structural racism, we're looking at the inter-institutional dynamics that produce and reproduce racially disparate outcomes over time. Uh, and one of the, the sort of most striking and, and, and gut-wrenching uh, racial disparity is, is household wealth. Right, and I'm sure a lot of the folks on, on in this room know already that the average white family has 10 to 13 times more wealth uh, than the average black family. Right, and and if you didn't know that, I hope that just felt like somebody hit you in the stomach. Um, and if you didn't know that, compare that with Orlando's thinking about narratives uh, and the things that we're not taught, uh, as well as the things that we are taught that we need to to unlearn. So if we go back to the definition and think about that huge disparity in wealth. Structural racism tries to look at the interinstitutional dynamics. How does the housing sector intersect with the education sector, intersect with the job sector, intersect with the transportation sector, intersect with the health sector to produce that racially disparate outcome in wealth and then to reproduce it over time? So you really start to have to develop a dynamic understanding of the way uh, the belief systems and institutional structures mutate over time with the common and, and, and universal objective to, to maintain this racialized hierarchy. Uh, and so we're trying to help build a collective analysis of what that means for the city of Detroit. Right? And we uh, have built these what we call issue clusters. Uh, so we say, what happens when you have structural racism intersect with fiscal austerity? Uh, and you map out an issue cluster that looks at municipal distress uh, and the fate of the school system uh, and uh, a tax foreclosure crisis and water shutoffs. Uh, and in the issue cluster, you see that these aren't separate and isolated uh, incidences. These are all part of the same intersection of logic between fiscal austerity and structural racism. And we need to understand how those are interconnected if we're gonna be getting to the praxis that, that, that Tuan is calling for. Uh, and we need that kind of, of, of common analysis if we're gonna align our efforts better. Uh, so that we're now rowing more in the same direction as opposed to uh, rowing in different directions. The other issue cluster we developed looks at the intersection between structural racism and militarism, right? Uh, and that intersection gives you uh, George Floyd and, and police brutality uh, and Islamophobia uh, and surveillance downtown uh, and gated communities uh, and the border patrol and, and the xenophobia and uh, the war on, on, on immigrants, right? Uh, those aren't isolated. Those are all part of that same uh, logic uh, of structural racism uh, and uh, 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 militarism. Uh, and we have to understand how those work. And again, uh, understanding, as I always tell my students, uh, is important because it needs to lead to strategic action, right? Knowledge in and of itself is really not that helpful. Uh, knowledge that is an aid to strategic action uh, is hoping to start to move uh, the ball forward uh, a little bit. Uh, and I've got uh, uh, one minute and 10 seconds. Uh, so I wanna give a shout out to the, to the deal, which is uh, the, the largest and, and I think most important program that the Key Center runs, uh, the Detroit Equity Action Lab. Uh, and the mission of the deal, which comes, coincides with what we're talking about here, uh, is really to develop the leaders who work to dismantle structural racism in Detroit. 
Uh, and the vision of the deal is to create a Detroit where racial equity drives opportunity and prosperity for all with no exceptions. Um, and you can think about it as a decentralized theory of change where we're trying to build the capacity as well as the fellowship uh, that enables everybody to be working uh, more effectively and collaboratively together. Uh, and we have great people. So if you wanna say who's on our design team that's helping uh, work through these fellowships, well, Tawana is on our design team. Uh, uh, Rihanna Bay Chester is on our design team. Uh, Namira Islam is on our design team uh, and Shay Bernardo is on our design team. And what that tells you is you can't do good work for anti-racism if you don't have good people and good teams and diverse teams. Uh, and we try to implement that in practice uh, and model the type of behavior that we're looking elsewhere. Uh, but I read, reread the book, uh, Tawana, over the weekend and, and it, it always is helping me thinking deeper and in more nuanced ways and, and you've helped improve my understanding uh, of these issues over the years and, and, and greatly uh, appreciative of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Hammer. And next up, we have Dr. Newman. Would you like to talk about how anti-racism shows up in your work? Sure. Um, I just want to thank everyone. This is an event that I'd just be happy to attend, let alone speak at, and I've already learned so much from all of you. And so um, I just want to say that, um, you know, there's so many things about what Tawana said that I thought were really important, but I'm particularly inspired by that kind of jump from going from coast conspirator to co-liberation and praxis. And that's kind of what I want to focus on. And in fact, it kind of makes me not even want to talk about what I've done, but just what I think I want to do or I want to think about doing going forward. Um, and, and I think the reason I think it's inspiring is because we're in the middle of this global movement, this anti-racist movement, and this global movement seeking to dismantle anti-blackness and all these different forms. And so many people are kind of at the stage of they're like, okay, how's this, what's this gonna look like a year out? What's gonna happen? What's all, what's, how's the energy gonna shift from the streets to other places? And I think what you told me helped me think through the fact that, well, we can't sit there and ask what's going to happen, it's on us. And it's on us to shift it, right? And if you think about movements that have had huge impacts over the years, one of the things they do is people stay in the streets, but they also shift this energy into our everyday life. And it's like we, um, and the question becomes, you know, how do we, how do we reweave our everyday lives or weave the movement into our everyday lives in different ways? And that's something I really want to think about. And, and I think everybody's answer to that question has to be different based on their position, um, based on their social positions, right? Um, but also based on like the kinds of professional positions we occupy in different places. And I think I've been thinking a lot about the way you can really make, one can make a movement last by embedding it in our daily lives in other places. Um, so for me, one thing that's really important is thinking about like Wayne State, for example, where I teach, um, which does not adequately represent this America's largest majority black city. You know, um, it sometimes gets touted as having a large um, number of African-American students, the student body, but is not um, where it should be. And we know that and even more nuanced level, I can see differences, the different levels I, I teach at. And so, um, I really want to think about in our teaching, you know, um, one thing we often do and we've done for a long time in social sciences is talk about structures that reproduce inequality, structures that reproduce anti-Black racism, right? But I want to think more about, and what I'm inspired to want to by what you've talked about is how do we think about building structures that perpetuate justice, like in the places we're in, right? I, and I really am inspired by the fact that in our own little ways in each place, if we can start building structures that perpetuate justice and perpetuate anti-racism, then I think we can make a lot of what's happening in this movement last. And we can all contribute to that in our own ways. And um, one of the things that drew me to my very problematic field of anthropology, and I, I'm not gonna use this space to get into that, but I'm happy to discuss it at another time um, or with questions. Um, is that it taught me that all the things we think of as social norms came from somewhere and are the product of some struggle for better or for worse, right? And so movement work to me also becomes about that shifting of social norms and the work we do to shift social norms. And so, um, you know, whether it's in research, um, which is one thing I do, and research is probably one of the most colonial aspects um, of the university and of knowledge gathering, 
But it's no coincidence, coincidence that the most colonial aspect also has the potential to be the most humanist if used correctly, right? It's weird that there's this flip between the two. It's so important for movement building and to relate and understand that relationship. Um, I used to think that was just that weird flip side between the colonial aspect of something and the fact that it also has this humanistic promise was something that was like uh, unique to anthropology. And then one day I realized it was a whole university that could was like that actually. And so I really wanna look at what in my mind, I used to consider more boring institutional work as actually really important right now, as creating structures within the institution, right? To, to really try to make it, and like what does an anti-racist department look like? What does an anti-racist major look like? Not just teaching, because I think it's very important. The thing I actually feel most comfortable with is some of the praxis, some of the thinking about history and asking whose history we teach. And that's something we've done a bit um, and we're gonna keep doing it more. But one thing I really wanna do now is go into a building stage and think about building structures. Um, those are kind of really, um, broad thoughts right now, but, and I think they have to be realized in a specific way, and we can all realize them. I think one of the most, I think that one of the key things, I know it's really important at a, at a department or at a university that is um, primarily white, right, even though it serves a predominantly black community, the important thing has to do with supporting black students, supporting students of color, supporting colleagues, and um, supporting colleagues of color and black colleagues in these environments um, and making in that kind of work, I think in that kind of structure building is what I see ahead of us right now. Um, and that's something that, yeah, so I'm, I'm focusing a lot. And even though it might sound a little, little dry at some levels, I realize that that's actually where a really important critical struggle needs to take place. So thank you, Tawana. Thank you so much, Dr. Newman. Um, and let's move right along. Um, Rep. Anthony, can you speak to us um, about how anti-racism shows up in your work? Uh, it shows up every day. I mean, I work at the state capitol. This is my um, freshman year, but I've served as a legislative staffer. I served as an advocate, a campaigner, and it is absolutely infused and embedded in every piece of the work. Um, so there's kind of some, some good, some bad, and some ugly, right? The good is that we have lots of representation, right? So I'm the first Black woman to represent um, Lansing in the legislature. We have a record number, for example, of African-American women serving in the House and the Senate. We have made gains in terms of who is at the table. But my freshman eyes started to see that as soon as you get more representation at one table, they build new tables, right? Um, and the thing that is the most frustrating about um, the system, the political system that we find ourselves in, because early on I started off at the grassroots level as a community organizer and then transitioned to elected office. And the thing I think has been interesting is, and I've grappled with, is does more representation actually equal moving the needle for black and brown communities? And I struggle with this. Right? So I have a large portfolio of bills that I have been working on since day one, right? Everything from um, advocating for uh, uh, it, it prohibiting discrimination on the basis of how our hair grows out of our head, right? So natural hair discrimination, um, eliminating restrictive covenants, literally documents on the books that say, if you are black, if you are um, Latino, if you are Jewish, you cannot live in this community. Eliminating some of that historically uh, discriminatory language. When we look at um, individuals like myself and others who have worked day in and day out to look at who has been disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus and what does it look like to make them whole, right? And when we look at the fine workers, our nursing staff, bus drivers, custodial and housekeepers. These are black and brown men and women who have been risking their lives for months. What does that actually look like to fight and advocate for those groups? You know, an example that I often point to, um, and I've shared, actually shared with um, my Republican colleagues, other uh, colleagues that are not black and brown is um, early in my tenure, uh, maybe last year, we, did an appropriation, a large appropriation for farmers. We realized that it was a disproportionately uh, wet year, 
you know, lots and lots of rain. We know we knew that farmers were becoming depressed, that crops were not manifesting in the way that they should. And so without many committee hearings, I don't think we actually had any committee hearings, without any real oversight and record speed, we appropriated millions of dollars to farmers to ensure that they're able to be made whole. And I'm not saying that that wasn't the right move, but now that we know that, for example, COVID disproportionately impacted black and brown communities, we have the data, we have the task forces. What does that look like to make our communities whole? You know, Tawana mentioned that this isn't because we are inherently sick, that we were, you know, disproportionately impacted by all these different pre existing conditions. It is racism. And so the thing that has been interesting to me is where is our public will when it comes time to looking out for these communities? It has been so encouraging to see everyone from Ingham County, the first uh, community who declared uh, racism as a public health crisis to our governor saying that we need to drop everything. We are in crisis. But the thing that I'm concerned about is are we going to do what we always do, which is name the thing, study the thing, create task force, create work groups, give fancy titles to the experts, and then put the information on the shelf, and then go back to business as usual. And I know everyone on this call, every all of our panelists, have been rumbling with that, have been grappling with this idea of, is this moment fading, right? The fact that every company from, you know, the NFL to some companies that I, I've never heard of are all magically starting to put out these perfectly curated statements about how Black Lives Matter. Maybe they do a, a training, a, a half day training, they have lunch. They put together maybe a small work group of the black and brown folks who happen to be in the, in the community and are in their uh, business. And then three months later, those well-intentioned black and brown folks will come up with recommendations and there will be no resources to actually do the work. We've seen this before. I'm in my mid thirties and I have seen this before. So I know folks who have come before me either in politics or business or the nonprofit sector have been here before. And so I am a hopeful person. I'm always hopeful, but I'm seeing and feeling this, this movement and this moment shift. And that is what I am nervous about. Um, so how I've been trying to, in my sphere of influence, tackle this is one, making sure that we're lifting as we climb, right? Opening up doors of opportunity for other elected officials, for interest groups, grassroots organizations to have as many seats as these tables as possible. You know, I, I work, I'm on the appropriations committee. So, you know, with budgets being moral documents, you know, the best way to see if we're not only talking the talk, but walking the walk, is to advocate for resources to ensure this is actually done with fidelity, right? Um, so I think that that is one piece. And then also looking at, and, and, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but there, is, there are concerted efforts. There are people who are sitting at tables. There are folks who are looking at what's happening and are trying to build the walls higher, build more tables, exclude more people, Find more creative ways to lock people out of the process, whether it is voting rights, whether it is making sure that our efforts are not fully funded, um, whether it is pacifying us with these gestures and these, again, perfectly curated statements. So I think this is going to take patience, but also us as individuals in the grassroots community, at elected office, in academia, to not be pacified by the moment and all of the, the uh, inch deep efforts, but rather actually digging in and holding these systems and these politicians accountable. And you notice that I, quite frankly, there is anti-racism work that needs to happen on both sides of the aisle. And I think that is, these are the types of courageous conversations that we need to be having, is we need to be holding everyone accountable, regardless of, the party that they belong to, the talk that they say on, on some of these Zoom calls and some of these perfectly you know, made up statements, it is not enough. We have to be assuming that everyone needs to do the work. Everyone needs to do the work. And I think a part of that work is going to be relying on 
experts who are putting themselves out there with actual expertise and not just leaning on, you know, folks who are going to at that solidarity <laughs> stage. And, and most of the folks at the solidarity stage over the past couple of months have called every one of their black and brown friends and said, what can I do? Teach me, tell me which books with which, uh, which movies, I have a Netflix account, which five documentaries should I, and I said, I'm not doing your work for you because we are in the middle of a global pandemic. Many of us have lost loved ones to COVID-19 and we are mourning. We have been inundated by images of black men and black women losing their lives at the hands of folks that we pay their tax, that we, we pay their salaries and they're murdering us. And we see that on loop. So many of us are traumatized by this moment. And the last thing that we have in us is to do the work for folks who need to do it for themselves. And so in the sphere of influence that I have, I have just rededicated myself to introducing policies that work to dismantle this system. I've worked, I, I am trying to, with my platform, lead in ways that hopefully um, makes this time different. But I think it's going to take us all being different, being more bold. And in the middle of the pandemic, I made a shift. And that shift was, because I, I, I am a, a consensus builder. I like to work across the aisle and get things done. And I've been able to get bills passed despite being a, you know, in the minority as a freshman. But I think the thing that I dedicated myself to doing is not pushing for policies and for an agenda solely for what I think is possible, what I think we can get done in this current climate. But I have committed to pushing policies that are actually gonna solve the problem. And that's going to take money. That's going to take a lot more work. It's going to take accountability. But I think it's what any leader in this space needs to do if we want this time to be different. So I, I hope I didn't go over too much. But um, thank you for the thanks for the opportunity. No, I'm actually a good organizer. I know to build in time because I know that other organizers are always <laughs> also very dedicated and, you know, um, so you're great. Thank you so much. Um, and last but not least, uh, one of my favorite people on the planet is Tinu Roland. And Tinu, can you speak to us about um, what anti-racism looks like for you and your work? Yeah, so... This is a little different than what everybody just did, but um, Megan pushed me to write an article um, for Riverwise. And I feel that it's fitting to read for y'all this little uh, short passage that I wrote because it was about how my work intersects um, and, and all of that. So I'm just gonna read that really quickly and, and that's it. <laughs> So it says, in the midst of a global pandemic that has forced myself and many others across the world to be at home, I've had the time to process my thoughts around what my work really means to me. I'm an aspiring abolitionist and freedom fighter, and I will not rest until all Black people are free. In reality, what does that look like as a practice? How is that actually embodied? Sitting through a time of political turmoil and hella uncertainty, the quote, we are the ones we have been waiting for rings in my head over and over. Our time is now, our moment is now. So many of us throughout the world have realized that the systems of oppression that continuously dehumanize us as people have to be abolished and a new way of living through liberation needs to happen. Unfortunately, oppressive systems did not manifest overnight, so there is no easy fix. But there are people in communities everywhere who are working towards our collective liberation. Agent Marie Brown refers to us as emergent. She says emergence notices the way small actions and connections create complex systems, patterns, and becomes ecosystems and societies. Emergence is our inheritance as a part of this universe. It is how we change. Emergence strategy is how we intentionally change in ways that grow our capacity to embody the just and liberated worlds we long for. In the framework of emergence, the whole is a mirror of the parts. Existence is fractal. The health of a cell is the health of the species and the planet. I like to think that I'm a fractal in the movement of liberating Black people. Emergence is also how I view my work in the ways in which it all intersects and contributes to the ecosystem we are building in Detroit around liberation. My political home at BYP 100 Detroit is an abolitionist youth organization that embodies the practice of Black queer feminism. This principle asks us, asks us 
the privilege and to empower those of us who experience more oppression based on being trans, queer, feminine, undocumented, poor, or disabled. What that means to me is that those who are closest to the margins of society's oppressed peoples have to be at the focal point of everything that we do. For far too long, Black women, trans and cis, girls and gender non-conforming people have existed at the epicenter of societal hatred fueled by stereotypes and damaging societal standards. This level of oppression reminds us that in order to get free, we must take the Black for Feminist approach. My work in the organization is building out the Detroit chapter as our membership chair. I am also leading our She Safe, We Safe campaign efforts in Detroit, a transformative movement campaign to address the gender violence impacting Black women, girls, both trans and cis, as well as gender non-conforming people. We understand gender violence is something that happens both between individuals and communities, and as something that is perpetuated and sanctioned by the state. We define the state as the governmental institutions that organize society, such as law enforcement agencies, public schools, child protective services, welfare agencies, and public housing. During the current COVID-19 epidemic, this moment has allowed the reality of gender violence to be seen more clearly. Just recently, I was made aware of an incident regarding a couple I knew. After several altercations and breakups, her life was taken by the person she chose to call her boyfriend. I found out about the incident after reading the news of a woman who killed her husband here in Detroit. The sad reality is gender violence is not just domestic. It is perpetuated by the state and it's also interpersonal. This level of violence is seen in every facet of our existence. The She Safe We Safe campaign has allowed us to be the container of stories for those who are always silenced. One of the beautiful things I found about the campaign is the way in which we love and support participants as they share their stories with us. During our kitchen table talks, which are small intimate groups where we discuss gender-based violence, I received a text from a participant who said that she was unable to make it saying that she was going through a lot and was not coming to the event. I was understanding of her situation, but it sat heavily on my heart. I called to talk with her after to find out her daughter had been suspended the prior week from school due to a bullying situation that not only was unresolved, but was progressing further. In addition to having a mentally abusive husband, this story is relevant to my thinking today as I reflect on these intersections. I also organize parents and youth with 42 Forward. We do education advocacy and organizing throughout the city of Detroit through neighborhood-based organizing. So when I heard her issues, I immediately jumped into organizing mode. As a parent myself, I recognize the school to prison pipeline that our youth are on. I'm also able to recognize our community's significant gaps in resources, teachers, food, mental health resources, true restorative practices, emotional intelligence, and cultural agility. Her story was not unique, but it was valuable. I see disciplinary issues that fail our youth every day. Her daughter ultimately ended up being suspended for the remainder of the year due to the gaps that I mentioned earlier. See, I struggle a bit in this moment when I think of what that means. In a bigger picture, that means a young person was punished, has been punished for protecting themselves when no one else would. This means that someone is currently at home from school with a parent who experiences different levels of gender violence and sadly someone who has been failed by our current system. It baffles me how interconnected these issues are and that our people are still being forced to deal with this oppressive, sad reality. One that even during a global pandemic has not stopped. This is what makes the Black for Feminist theory important. It is the will to protect the most vulnerable at all costs. When I think of what liberation looks like, it is the will to push far beyond what we know now. It is the emergence of something new that swarms together like little starlings. We are here at the crossroads, the choice to decide whether or not the future and liberation are the same thing. This is the moment that requires us to create our own ecosystem and how we'll choose to live. Our fractal existence is just that, a piece of our liberatory world. I challenge everyone to push past your comfortability levels and challenge your thinking. Imagine a world where we all are free. There is no prison industrial complex, nonprofit industrial complex, isms such as capitalism, phobias such as transphobias, attack on K-12 education with a clear path to school to prison, food insecurities, homelessness, or so many others that we all know we have a laundry list of in this current society. How do we begin to change our current political climate in Michigan? We start within our communities and our organization and we make what is deemed impossible possible. We shift our energy and our focus and we no longer play the game the way that our government has chosen to deal with us. We build our world the way, the way we see fit and we, get, we begin to play it that way because that's what freedom looks like. Last summer, BYP 100 Detroit chapter hosted a poly ed around hyper surveillance in the city of Detroit, Project Greenlight, which Tawana told us about earlier. Our coalition is Greenlight Black Futures. We host political educations and communities designed to make space for participants to dream of a world where oppression such as mass surveillance and food insecurities and poor education just are no longer factors. 
and communities members sat in a room and focused hope and began to dream of having access to mental health institutions, transportation options that are safe, clean, and affordable, love and support in their lives, individuality, and the right to be who they are. No pollution and misuse of our planet, a world where water and other earthly essentials are not owned by corporations, but are given back to the land. Access to affordable and quality education and childcare and elimination of food deserts. While in prison, Asada Shakur's sister wrote her a letter. Inside were some of the most powerful words of love and liberation I've read. She said, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. What that means to me is that we need to continue to break systemic barriers, whether small or monumental. It is time to dream of the world, to dream of our world and plan how we get free. We are in this thing called life together and the only way we win is collectively. People have suffered for hundreds of years and will continue to suffer to this day. We have nothing else to lose but the chains of oppressions that bind us. What will I do? What will you do? And how will we do it together? Awesome. Thank you, Tino. I think that's a really fitting way actually for us to transition um, into the question and answer portion um, of today. So I, um, I uh, um, encourage anyone in the audience who has a question um, to throw them out now. Um, while we wait for that, one came in um, earlier that I'm just gonna throw out right now. Um, and, and just so you know, these can be questions for Tawana if you wanna, you wanna have her um, you know, speak about anything or it can be questions uh, for the um, respondents as well. Um, so the first one was for Dr. Hammer, actually. And somebody asked if, if, if you saw a connection or you could discuss some of the ties at all um, between structural racism um, and critical race theory. Yeah, so I, I view a lot of these things as, as, as all in the same basket, right? So uh, as, as Orlando was, it's the narrative. How do we think, right? What is our analysis? Uh, what do we think about history? How do we look at the connection as, as was alluded to between racism and, and capitalism? Uh, and, and there's different sort of points of entry for different people, right? And, and so you kind of take the point of entry where you're at. Uh, uh, you kind of look at the, the gaps that you have in your own training because nobody's trained in America to be an anti-racist or, or to decolonize, right? So we all have to start where we're at and find the, the tools and gaps that we don't have. Uh, and, and critical race theory has been incredibly helpful to me in, in thinking about uh, the law, uh, thinking about uh, institutions, thinking about society. Uh, so it certainly is an amazing resource and, and uh, people should, uh, you know, if they're moved by that, certainly take a look at that and, and, and learn that. Thank you. Um, this question is for Tawana. Um, how do we, um, you know, you, you spoke about that idea that we have to move beyond this notion of um, white privilege versus um, black underprivilege. Um, and I know that that's um, something that a lot of people haven't grappled with. What do you think um, is the best way to get people to, you know, when they're thinking about this work, move beyond um, that dichotomy? Yeah, I mean, really it's, it's about thinking about the psychological impact of putting that type of narrative into the psyche of a white child or a black child, right? Um, if we think about the violence that I talked about in my presentation, and you, uh, if you look at the, the crime, the quality of life crimes in black communities, you look at the crimes in white communities, because um, I'm gonna, I, I like to raise both, um, and put them side by side. If you look at the school shootings in white schools, you can look at the trajectory of the mentality of those young white students uh, of being othered and not being able to live up to the notion of white superiority and white supremacy. So it has a reverse impact. So you have young black children who are uh, being raised up to think that they're underprivileged, that if you're in Detroit, that you grew up in a city that are full of hopeless, helpless uh, people who don't care about their homes, who, who, um, who are uh, uh, prone to crime, 
who are illiterate, um, who don't want to work. I mean, there is no shortage of, of the narrative, but the system of white supremacy has allowed for both situations to happen. The reasons for school shootings in Columbine is tied to the very same system uh, that has, school, has uh, neighborhood shootings on the east side of Detroit. And so if we start to think about how um, community members are of all demographics are forced to live up to a particular uh, condition, then we can see why it plays out a certain way. I saw that someone in the chat talked about Asians as an, uh, as an example, the model minority um, and having to um, kind of adjust to the American way of being, which means that the, the proximity to whiteness defines how you survive and thrive within a system but um, I know many uh, Asian people who would tell you that they've never been able to live up to, uh, to the, the notion that uh, Asians are a model minority or that they're inherently going to thrive within uh, the American dream, right? And so I think that if we think about the system of white supremacy as having these tentacles in all of our racial demographics, um, and then we can look at how it plays out within each community, um, particularly if I'm thinking about black and white, then we can start to address some of the root, ca root causes that um, perpetuate harm in our communities, uh, whether it's domestic violence, uh, alcoholism, uh, school shootings in white communities, and whether it is um, violence or fratricide in black communities. Um, and so, yeah, so it's really about reshaping the narrative, reclaiming, the actual history, um, telling the truth about what has happened in society and re-educating um, through our institutions. And I'll finally say this, I, I come across young black people who maybe didn't grow up in Detroit often who have not experienced direct racism, right? And so I've had a young black uh, student tell me, well, I've never experienced racism. And the response is every time you open a textbook, you experience racism. And so anytime you're, you're being educated, whether you're white, black, Asian, Arab, um, brown, uh, or any racial demographic, and it's lying to you about who you are as a person and what has happened in history, then you are experiencing racism, internalizing racism, and often perpetuating racism. Thank you, Tawana. This question is for Orlando. So in what ways will Bridge Detroit help change the Detroit narrative? Um, and how will it compete with the two major papers um, and changing the stories that impact that Detroit psyche? Thank you for the question, I appreciate it. Um, I, I want to say, first of all, that we are not in competition with the Detroit News or the Free Press. <laughs> They're a daily and they've been you know, institutionalized as a Detroit daily for years. And the way that we tell our stories and the way that we deliver news is completely different uh, than the Detroit Free Press um, and the Detroit News. What we plan to do is sort of flip the traditional news model on its head by not being gatekeepers of information, but talking to actual Detroiters who experience the most barriers to their being able to thrive to ascertain what their information gaps are, the stories that they want to tell, to ascertain the kind of relationships in their past that they've had with media. Most of the people that I've been talking to have had a very transactional relationship with media organizations and have experienced media organizations not really adequately delivering their words in a way that is honorable to them. Uh, that keeps uh, Detroiters with their dignity and not prostituting the stories of Detroiters. And so we're careful with how we tell stories. And so you may see us tell a story that broke news two days ago, but in a completely different way. That's how we want to do it. We want to talk to as many Detroiters as we can and then leverage the expertise of journalism within our newsroom to tailor the journalism that we produce to the information gaps and the wants and needs that Detroiters have identified through series of conversations. So I will tell you, all I do is have conversations. Dr. Hammer knows I have a ton of conversations. It has been challenging uh, in the midst of the pandemic, not being able to gather people. And I want to emphatically name and state that uh, we wanna talk to uh, Detroiters 
who necessarily don't have access to Zoom or the internet. So walking with that and recognizing that as a challenge, but not giving up on how to solve for it is something that I am racking my brain about um, every single day. So I, that's how uh, we'll be different. I do want to uplift that our founder is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and our, our managing director and editor uh, worked at the Michigan Citizen for years, worked at Vibe, and she is a Black woman uh, who runs the day-to-day -day operations. And so I am proud of the team that we've been able to pull together. And I think just from that, uh, the news and vantage point would be different. Last thing, I got to be able to go home to the block at night because I live in the city of Detroit. And there's a different level of accountability that comes when you're not helicoptering and telling stories about Detroit versus when I'm telling the stories of my neighbors, I'm telling my stories. And so I'm actively challenging this notion of objectivity that this system of white supremacy has created, right? That has been, you know, really recent in the 20th century. And what happens is the, the notion of objectivity has been used to police black voices from expressing dissent. In, uh, in these movements and to express dissent and anti-Black racism, all of that. And so we are challenging all of that at the same time and launch, did I say, did we, did I say we launched during the pandemic and while launching during the pandemic? So I'll leave it there. Thank you. I think that's such an important point um, to make, especially as um, I move to this next question. Um, this one is um, for uh, Tinu, actually. Um, Tinu, for somebody who is, you know, young or new to the cause or just interacting with all these kinds of ideas, um, but who wants to get involved and who wants to make a difference and who wants to, you know, uh, figure out those things, what? What do you think are some lessons that you've learned? Um, and uh, what do you think is maybe the most important thing for them to know as they enter into um, doing organizing advocacy or policy work? Yeah, um, I think that's a great question. I think um, I think it was Tawana who touched on it a little bit earlier about um, how we have to kind of... How <laughs> how we have to in 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 our in our um she this this face made me lose my whole train of thought. I'm sorry, Megan. Can you repeat the question to me again? I do apologize. <laughs> um. So, what do you think is the most important thing for like a you know somebody who's new to all of this, somebody who's just interacting it but wants to be? A part of it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. so I think for me, the the very important thing about um, being kind of new to organizing and finding my place and my way was I didn't just jump straight into organizing around all of I didn't jump straight into education organizing. I didn't. I began to scope out education organizing. And I began to scope out what it meant to, to be a Black queer feminist. And so I literally was able to take my time and just pay attention to how people move because you're not gonna wanna move with everybody. And that's just, that's just the honest truth. Like everybody in our movement is not moving the way that you would like to move. And so you have to find your place. You have to find the space that is your ecosystem and you also have to find your role. Um, but more importantly, Tawana mentioned it earlier about how it has to be something that is here. And if it's not here, then you're organizing for all of the wrong reasons and you will burn yourself out and a burnt out organizer is not beneficial to our movement. And so take your time, find out who you are um, and your place in the movement will follow all of that. Thank you. Um, this next set is for um, Rep. Anthony. Um, so as, as we think about like how we move from, you know, thinking about these things in our daily lives and then translating them and being able to hold our leadership accountable, um, there's a couple of questions that I think are coming up for you. So one, what can we do to support you at the, at your tables? Um, and then also, you know, what do you think is the best way at going about holding an elected official accountable accountable 
when they're in a district potentially where these issues um, aren't necessarily right at, on the forefront of their mind, right? So, you know, they don't, if they're in an entirely white or suburban or, you know, wealthier district, how do we, how do we create that pressure um, in those spaces? Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about your, your, the latter question. And uh, I actually had a, um, a Caucasian colleague from a suburban area um, who happens to be a Democrat and they were struggling with some of these issues, right? Um, which may not be uh, very politically popular when you're talking about reforming um, systems that many folks benefit from, probably including this legislator, right? And they said, well, you know, I don't think that my district is going to be with me. And I, and I hate to always bring it back to this, but I said, well, I'm pretty sure many of the, the decision makers during slavery were also leading their communities, their respective states um, to a place that they weren't necessarily there yet, but right is right. And we want to be on the right side of history. And I think that sometimes courage trumps um, your job. Um, sometimes it's about doing the right thing at the right time um, and not always thinking about your next political move and whether you're going to um, have a, a, a position in, in a caucus or if you're actually going to sustain that work. Now that's easy for me to do, right? Like I am in a community that um, uplifts and encourages me to take risk if it means everyone does a little bit better. Um, regardless of their race and their class and their gender. I mean, I am in that place of privilege and I'm, I'm happy to be in, in that, but you know, I'm always willing to be an ally and, and coach folks to a place they need to be. Um, and that's leadership. And that's the difference between being a politician and being a real leader is, is making the case for why this matters and that all boats can really rise if we actually have the will to, to lift them up. Um, in terms of, you know, how folks can be helpful, I mean, I think that I have a list of um, policy proposals that uh, I am actively working on, actively advocating for, and which I can share with you all. And um, I, I need rapid response. I need support, right? Um, again, some of these issues, you'd be surprised. Um, that the folks who are stakeholders and allies in many other spaces, when you start talking about systemic racism and injustice and how some folks have benefited from many of these systems, you start to lose some allies, right? Lose some supporters. I think that folks having the courage to step up and say, you know what, I, I know that we may have benefited from this, but we are actually, um, in a, in a point of history that we can do that, I think that that's, I think that would be helpful. So I can provide that list um, because obviously sometimes it's the political will um, that actually ensures things get done. Um, <clears throat> so I can definitely provide that list. Um, and th I think the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, it would be awesome to have people show up at committee hearings, um, writing letters of support, contacting the legislators from across the state um, when the rubber meets the road. I'll give you an example. So a couple months ago, actually on April 30th, when men and women who decided to serve as state legislators decided to go into the Capitol and were met with large guns, were met with flags and nooses and swastikas, and were at gunpoint when we were just trying to do our job. And when we looked to systems to protect us, and I'm, and I'm talking about all of us, but particularly for black and brown folks, when we see Confederate flags and nooses, that is a very clear sign. Um, and when we were met with, you know, this act of violence, this domestic terrorism, uh, many of our allies told us to get over it. Many of the folks who, you know, we said, well, we can move on. We have other things to think about and prioritize. When we looked to many partners who said, we've got your back, um, they didn't have our back. And so some of us decided to take measures into our own hands and protect ourselves, but we will need folks like the people who are on this call to step up with us, to lift up their voices when it matters. And 
So I have a rapid response team on some some of those issues, but even partnering with the Michigan Legislative Black Caucus, um, some of our other groups who are crying out for people to show up when it matters. Um, I'm happy to make some of those connections because we need the voices. And I do believe that we have more well-intentioned folks who are willing to do the work than we think. We just need to get organized. And I am excited about the energy of folks who actually are willing to start organizing and, and collectively lifting up those voices. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna squeeze in one final question. Um, this is for Dr. Newman. So um, first, for any of you who don't know, this is the book. It's called A People's Atlas of Detroit. And it's amazing. Um, it has um, work from activists all the way from Mama Lila Cabell to Charity Hicks from Grace Lee Boggs uh, to Tawana, who's on the call today. Um, it's a really, it's a testament to, um, if, if you know anything about anthropology um, or, you know, just academia in general, and then to see the amount of work that went into um, actually uplifting the voice of the people with whom the work was being done, um, it's, it's pretty amazing. So the link is in the chat, but I also wanted to ask Dr. Newman, could you speak just a little bit? And I know we're running close on time, but I would love for you to speak a little bit about what it was like to do that work and how you bring that lens into communities that might not necessarily, you know, be communities that you're from or, um, you know, how we do what, you know, avoid what Orlando was talking about with the helicoptering and, and make it authentic. Um, yeah, sure. I think in a lot of ways, what Orlando spoke about are things that I also feel like a lot of people who are trying to think about rethink, I guess, rethink what social science and research looks like. This is a very similar situation. And, you know, in a moment of radical honesty, what I really should say is I think I almost stumbled into anti-racism work through this project because, um, when I started at Wayne State, one of the first things I wanted to do was just to get to know Detroit, but I didn't want to get to, because I came from being a graduate student in New York City, and I, this was 10 years ago, and I didn't know the city that well, and um, I really kind of didn't, decided I didn't want to kind of do a research project or start off trying to recruit people to be a part of my project. I just wanted to go be a normal person and meet people and see what was going on. And I was interested in food justice and things like that. Um, and in many respects, that project began with the happenstance meeting where I ran into Linda Campbell and um, who some of you know, who's worked with the People's Platform. And this funny conversation happened where she said, oh, you know, it, you know, what do you do? And I said, oh, I am just started teaching at Wayne State. I'm getting to know the place. I'm an anthropologist. And she goes, oh, you're an anthropologist? I've got a research project for you. And I was like, I was trying to avoid doing this right away. But I really let, but I realized that that accidental moment was actually a really important moment that subverted what research is about. Because the traditional colonial model of research is that experts in the university decide what's important, right? And then they design this project. And I realized I happened upon, in fact, in partnership and learning from so many people, Linda, so many people in the community that actually what my task was, I guess, in the book, I'm an editor, right? I, it's, in a, it's, it's about providing the means or infrastructure from some of the training I have to um, work with a lot of different partners and collaborate and build together a project, right? And so in some ways, what I was hoping to do, and I think it's not just me, it's students and colleagues, and there's people all over the country, I think trying to think about research justice is to subvert that old model a little bit. Um, and so that's kind of the idea. And, and also thinking a lot about history and movement and going back to narrative, like Orlando was talking about is really important. And I think with Detroit in particular at that time, to think about the city's movement history as a continual touchstone was really important for a lot of us. But above all, it was just about laying the infrastructure, right? But not actually, it wasn't my place, right? To sort of be that voice. So that's sort of the idea. Um, I, so I hope that's helpful, but that's kind of where how that started. And I think I've now, I think a lot of us have developed a bit of some guiding principles from that. Awesome, thank you, that's extremely helpful. 
Um, as we wrap up, I wanted to kick it to Tawana. Did you have any closing thoughts that you wanted to offer to everybody as we exit the space today? Uh, I just want to say that um, just remember that this is a protracted struggle, that, um, that it's more of a marathon than it is a sprint, and that it's going to take a bunch of relays and a bunch of passing to one another as we move through um, the different modes of how we enter the anti-racism struggle. But remember, at the center of it is humanity. And collectively, we can create the world that we all deserve. Thank you. Thank you all. OK, so um, I'm just going to share uh, this, if I can get my um, screen to work right. Share this with all of you. Okay. Are you guys all seeing my screen? No. No, it's not working. Here we go. Okay. So I just want to say, first of all, a huge thank you to all of um, of you who joined us today. Um, I think it's extremely important um, that, you know, we all think about this collectively and what we're all up to. Um, and moving forward, you know, for Future Michigan, it really is our goal to uplift the voices of Michiganders for us to see, you know, true system change that comes from um, the voice of the people and not from, you know, any other way than that, um, that we drive policy um, through using um, the voices of Michiganders and regular people, everyday people. Um, and I think it's been extremely inspiring for me. I've, I've met some new people here on this call today. Um, I wanna thank uh, the panel, um, I, all, all of you attendees, sorry. Um, it's, it's gonna be really important. I mean, this involves all of us um, that, like I said, none of us, I don't think should be able to rest until all of us can rest. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, um, but we can do it. And um, so you can you can find us on For Michigan's Future, For Future Michigan, or For Our Future Michigan, depending on the different um, social media feed. You can email me at mdouglas, and then I will definitely send out a follow-up email um, with links that you can um, get um, to Tawana um, she does these trainings um, and there's um, a way that you can contact her through um, um, AMP Media to be able to book her for the future. If you, you know, liked your theory and you want more, um, this was an abbreviated version of her training. It, it can go much deeper. Um, so um, I can, I'll send out that. I'll send out um, all of the contact information um, for the various panelists today so that you can reach out to them if you want. And then please always feel free to reach out to me. Um, but so with that said, we've gone four minutes over time um, and I'm trying really hard to uh, respect everybody's time. Um, and um, I appreciate you. I love you all. And, um, you know, in love and struggle, uh, we're here. So thank you. <laughs>